And now, I'd like to introduce our, our closing keynote speaker, Kayleen McCabe. She is so passionate. You ought to see her upstairs bouncing around the green room. <laughs> As a licensed contractor and stud finder winner, Kayleen will share her wealth of experiences to show how CTE is truly art in the eye of the beholder. From concept to construction, she uses her unique, unique combination of gutsy innovation and expert skills to tackle any home improvement project. You name it, she can build it. As a dynamic host of DIY Network's Rescue Renovations, this power tool ninja transforms challenging projects into vibrant homes. Please join me in welcoming our closing keynote speaker, Kayleen McCabe. Hello, I am thrilled to be here. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. Um, many of you I have had the wonderful opportunity to meet prior to this. I am a huge, huge fan of CTE, being a general contractor based out of Denver, Colorado. Right, woo! Square State say hey. Uh, I'm very, very excited to be here. And since I have met many of you before, I thought actually I would share um, some stories that I haven't really shared before. The first one I want to talk about is how did I go from being on television to this stage? And the second story I want to share is the first time I ran a marathon. <laughs> um, so during hiatus from rescue renovation, I would do a lot of volunteer work. I am a terrible sitter, I don't sit still well, and I really enjoy volunteering my time because it makes me feel good to pass on my construction skill and help out homeowners. And so I would do a variety of projects, and I was once asked to install some kitchen cabinets for a homeowner who was receiving a whole brand new kitchen. This was a very, very fancy and cool opportunity for this homeowner, a brand new kitchen, how neat. And so when I got to the house, I realized that the kind of the feeling at the house was a bit tense. Now, sometimes this happens because unlike other industries, working in construction can be very stressful. You are asking somebody to look at blueprints, do math in their head, and then express it through their hands and their body. Um, and so sometimes if you're working on a house that's a bit difficult, you can get stressed out and things are intense. But I realized as I was at the job site that it had nothing to do with the house or the quality of the subs that I was working with. It was actually the homeowner. Ooh, uh, um, now, I'm used to being watched. Obviously, spending five seasons on a television show doing construction, I am very used to having a camera crew over my shoulder all the time. But this homeowner, I felt more of like a, I was a mouse and she was a hawk. And I was like, this is just odd. And I remember I was out in her garage unpacking all the cabinets. And I do something when I do construction called mise en place. It's a French culinary term where you put everything in its place before you get started. I think this is a valuable lesson when you're doing construction, even as a DIYer, because when you do that, you're actually sounding out the project. So you're kind of doing it once already in your head to see what materials you need. And then when you're in the swing of things, you aren't wasting time looking for that one tool that's somewhere. And so I'm unpacking all the cabinets and the homeowner comes out to the garage and she's, I can tell she's watching me quite frustratingly. And she's like, well, this is just taking so long. I don't understand why it's taking so long. I see it faster happening on TV shows. <laughs> now, when I do volunteer work, I never tell people that I have a TV show because name dropping my name does nothing. Uh, I tried name dropping my name once, nobody cares. And so it's not, it, there's no point in me going onto a job site and being like, don't you know who I am? Um, so she kept making little comments like this and I would respond with things like, well, on these shows, there's a lot of editing that happens. There's a lot of things you don't see behind the scenes. Um, you know, trying to be encouraging to let her know that, no, this is actually the real pace of construction. And what you're seeing on TV is obviously edited. 
and fate. Because it is television, I only have 22 minutes to tell a story of an entire remodel project. A lot of things are edited out, like me doing math in my head. Do you know how boring it is to watch me do math in my head? Watch. Right? It's awful. I'm not going to do some like long-winded skit on that. Uh, it's really boring. Same with me unboxing cabinets. They're not going to put that in the show because nobody cares. And I, I watched this homeowner over a number of days berate me, berate the other contractors, nitpick everything, inform us how to do our jobs um, because she had seen it done differently on shows. And I'm keeping my mouth shut. And there was a hot minute, I kid you not, that I looked around in all the corners of the house to see if the network had hidden cameras and hired an actress. Because I was like, there's no way. She's an actress, and they're just coming up with a concept to see if they could drive me nuts and like put a homeowner inside a cabinet. <laughs> like, shh. <laughs> it was not the case. Uh, so it's the last day, and I'm putting up the light rail on the bottom of her cabinets. I'm just about to be finished, and I hear from her den my voice. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, no, the jig is up. <laughs> Dang it. I almost snuck out of her without her knowing that I was on TV. Well, there was, my show was airing, and she had the DIY network on a lot, and my show comes on, and she comes flying into the kitchen, and suddenly her whole disposition had changed. Oh, Kayleen, you're so fabulous. You're such a great contractor. Oh, you're so wonderful. Can you sign my cabinets? I didn't say what I wanted to say, which was, no, you were rude to all the other contractors. You had no respect for the other subs in this place. I never watched you ask for the signature of the drywaller, the electrician, the HVAC, the flooring, all these people you were so mean to. No. What I told her, much more diplomatic, was, I'm sorry, I'm contractually obligated not to give out my autograph on volunteer projects. <laughs> I can say whatever I want. I own my signature. <laughs> so I took a step back, and I realized this had nothing to do with the homeowner at all. What it had something to do with was the fact that I was a part of an industry that was actively participating in devaluing a trade that I love so much. And that is not on purpose. These entertainment networks do not set out to do anything but entertain. And a lot of people are watching these shows and taking them as education. And then what they're showing are facts. And when I shot my show, I was on set every single day. I love construction. It's genuine. Um, I love the sound of power tools. I love being filthy. Um, I just bought my very first purse. What? Well, usually they're toolboxes, uh, right? <laughs> I'm a lady now. Uh, I love it. Construction is in my blood. But what I couldn't control was the edit of my TV show. And so while I was there every day working with my guys and we were creating great things, television shows are made by very, very talented, passionate people who go to school to make television shows. I had an editor once tell me, Oh, Kayleen, will you please stop talking about framing? It's so boring. And I'm like, uh, I'm in a 3,000 square foot unfinished basement with just piles of studs everywhere. I don't know what you want me to talk about. Because I'm not talking about paint color, because I don't care. Like, I don't design, I build. And so that was sort of the realization that I was participating in this. And my hope when I had started the show was to bring the trades back up to a level where homeowners would stop before they did demo. Because they realized that craftsmen do this. The people who are passionate about working on the most expensive investment you will ever have are out there and we're really serious about it. And so I started to, every time I was out of town, I would Google search what school is close to me. And I would go to schools and be able to talk to the students and say, hey, 
listen, I know they're not telling you this, but you can be really successful by working in the trades. I don't have a college degree, and I love what I do, and even though I'm a female, I can swing a hammer, and it makes me very, very happy. And that kind of picked up momentum and steam when I started to talk to other organizations. But being here today, for me, is a highlight beyond anything else. Because you folks are the ones who can put this message on repeat, and you do every day. You're in contact more regularly with the students that I can see. I can come into your school and cheer them on and light them up and be like, do it, I love it. You're the ones saying, this is how. Let me teach you the skill. Let me show you the pathway to get that career. And so being here, being able to talk to you now, it's like talking to the choir. I love it more than anything. And I am not finished on my mission. I feel like I have a lot more um, karma to pay off from doing the TV shows. And so I love the fact that I get to continue to encourage not only students to consider this career, but then hitting it home for parents and letting them know that encouraging your child to follow this pathway is something that's incredibly beneficial and that there are multiple pathways to success. College is one of them, but the trades is also a huge, huge highway. Right? So now let me transition into the story of my first marathon. Oh, my legs still hurt. <laughs> um, back in 2012, um, an organization that I do a lot of volunteer work called Rebuilding Together, they were doing a promotion where if they signed up people for the Colfax Marathon in Colorado, they got 100% of the sign-up fee. And this was if you signed up for a fun run, the half marathon, the full one. And as the participants signing up, you didn't have to finish for rebuilding together to get the fee. So of course I signed up for a full marathon. Like, it's like, why not? Um, a little bit of background with my athleticism. Uh, the last time I had actually run was probably back in 86. Uh, and it was like a mile or two. Um, Sports really weren't my thing. I'm definitely, I was a choir nerd. I was a yearbook geek. Um, sports, like, eh, not, my, not my bag of beans. But the marathon was only six hours long. And, right, <laughs> whatever. Um, what I did know is that I worked in construction. And I also lived in a high rise that I made the commitment that when I moved into the high rise, I would always take the stairs home. And I lived on floor 38. Um, so I was spending 12, 14, 16 hour days doing construction all day, carrying things, walk up and down stairs, and then I get home at night and choose to walk upstairs. Um, it's sort of like my decompression moment is zen. Um, and if you haven't walked stairs in big buildings, do it, it's fascinating. It's the great way to look at construction. I'm a nerd for it. Um, so I figured, all right, if I spend six or seven days a week on my feet for this many hours, I wonder how far I can get in six hours if I just like trot. Like, I don't know, let's see. So before the marathon, I never trained. Uh, why? <laughs> We were shooting, we were shooting a season, too busy. Uh, the night before the marathon, we finished filming at like midnight. I went home and drank a few beers, and then got to bed at like 1.30. Um, the next morning, I woke up and I laced up my brand new shoes, uh, put on my brand new running outfit, um, and the running outfit I bought on purpose because it had a pocket in it. And so in the pocket, I packed my cell phone and money because I figured when I'm over it, I'll just call my dad and he can come pick me up. So uh, again, not being really familiar with sports or like sporting events, I mean, I'm not big into sports. I think the wave is the greatest human activity on earth. And that's why we should do sports. That's, uh, that's it for me. Um, Cool with like football and stuff, but it's the wave. Um, so as I was approaching where the venue and the fin or the start line was at, I hadn't really planned. 
and there being that many cars and people. And I ended up parking about a mile and a half away and was running late. So I trot myself up to the start line and I get there and what an experience. I wasn't expecting it at all. The place was packed and it was full of the most vibrantly dressed, enthusiastic people. There were flamingos and brides and people in inner tubes and green suits. It, it was very entertaining. And so I find my way to the back because clearly I have no business being up front. Um, and the gun goes off and you just kind of swept into this momentum. Like, you're suddenly just moving, and I ran a few miles. You don't even realize it. And the way that the Colfax marathoners, or the planners, had laid it out is we started near the Denver Zoo, and we kind of run around a park, and we run through the main fire department, which suddenly, like, I'm an athlete. <laughs> I'm fine. Oh, hey, fireman. I'm not even breaking a sweat. Look. <laughs> uh, we continue running. We get to run into Mile High Stadium, where the Broncos play. And wow, what an incredible experience. I love architecture. I'm a nerd for it. And so the run up, you actually feel like you're running into a coliseum. And then being able to run on the floor of the stadium was incredibly impressive. You feel so tiny. And I was like, cool, all right. This is pretty neat. Now. After you run through the stadium, they had us run back on Colfax. Now, a little bit about Denver's terrain. Um, it's really only hilly in the mountains. Like, you know, it's like mild hills. You don't see really steep stuff. Like, for an example, um, the bike I have in town is a beach cruiser with a cup holder. Like, it's not extreme. Except for Colfax Avenue which is basically a nice incline until you reach the mountains. <sighs> and so we have six miles of this glorious incline going towards the mountains until you get to turn around and come back. Now, I don't, again, I'm not really recognizing the distance yet. I kind of am. You know, there are these like little moments that spark in. I'm like, you're volunteering to do this. You can stop any time. Like, you don't need to do this. And there's a lot to watch. There's bands playing. There's people cheering still. There's architecture, too. At that portion of Colfax, which happens to hold the record, is the longest numbered route in the US. Sorry, Route 66. Hmm. Uh, it's a lot of Art Deco buildings, really interesting architecture, cool mom and pop shops. And so again, I'm not really recognizing it. And I'm still at a trot. You know, over every major intersection, Denver Fire Department had taken their ladder trucks and put up banners and sort of through those intersections too. I was like, I got this again. <laughs> I'm looking good. Uh, about a two miles away from the turnaround point, my shins start to hurt. And again, I was like, this is dumb. Why am I here? Like, rebuilding together gets 100% of the volunteer fee. Like, I don't have to finish. And so I was like, okay, I'm just gonna make it a little bit longer. And about a half a mile longer. I was like, that's it. Pull out my phone and give dad a call. Phone rings and rings and it goes to voicemail. So immediately I hang up and call back. I was like, he's old, he didn't hear it. You know, let me try it again. Yeah. Ring, ring to voicemail. So I was like, all right, maybe he's out in the shop or he's busy. I'm gonna keep going, because at this point, I could see in the distance the turnaround point, and I could see that there was like Gatorade, you know. So I was like, I'll go to that turnaround point and then give him a call again, you know, so. I'm still like, this is kinda dumb, whatever. I get, to the, I get to that table, that turnaround point. The people there are out of their minds, excited that I made it. And I was like, well, I shouldn't call my dad now. <laughs> Like, <laughs> this will be really awkward. <laughs> like, yeah, I made it. I'm out of here. Uh, um, but they fed me Gatorade, and I ate the most delicious granola bar I had ever crammed into my face at full speed. Uh, and they were really encouraging. They didn't know me. 
They didn't know any of us. They were just really impressed because they knew what we had just gone through to get there. And so, of course, I didn't call my dad because it just would have been super awkward. And I figured at that point, all right, I'm going to turn around and head back. It's all downhill at this point. Fine. So I can tell clearly after that, like, a little bit of liquid and snack did me some good. Sitting, you know, not sitting, but just standing still for a second was beneficial. And cool, I can handle this. I keep going, and I was like, well, this isn't that bad. It is really mostly all downhill, fine. Now, again, the planners of the Colfax Marathon, they wanted to mix it up for us. They didn't want us to run down Colfax the whole time. That would be far too boring. And so instead, they diverted the marathon down to a street called 17th Avenue. 17th Avenue is beautiful. Somebody sounds like they already know, like this. Yeah, I heard a laugh. Uh, 17th Avenue is full of gorgeous old architecture. Um, if you follow 17th Avenue, it's actually where the finish line is at. Before that, there are tons and tons of restaurants with great patios. You know, I figured there'd be people cheering. But the one thing that those sadistic planners of the Colfax Marathon is at 17th Avenue in Broadway, about mile 23 and a half into the marathon, there is a hill, and it is a serious hill. It's about five blocks of a very steep incline. And why, why would you be so mean? Like, what's wrong with these people? Like, you're already crazy enough to think you're gonna run a marathon. Like, what's wrong? And so, at that point, I was definitely tired. I was like, fine, you know, I could tell that it was coming towards the end, because um, the crowds, you know, it sort of dissipated on the run up. And I start up this hill, and I get halfway up. And then I realize I'm going to die. <laughs> I won't have time to call my dad to come pick me up, because this is where my heart explodes, and I die. Uh, I could actually see my heartbeat in my eyeballs. I didn't know that was a thing. Like, I, it is, believe me. Um, and my heart was pounding so hard that all I, that's all I could hear in my ears was like, boom, boom, da da And I'm standing on this incline. I'm like, I'm gonna die, this is it. I hope they have stretchers close. And I'm taking, like, I'm getting my breath back. I can kind of, Okay, okay, I'm not going to die, but I might sort of die. Uh, and I start to hear ringing. Not any sort of ringing. It's not like ringing in my ears. What I was hearing all of a sudden was a cowbell being rung really enthusiastically. Now, if you hear a cowbell being rung like that, you should do one thing. Because one of two things is happening. You should run because either you're in front of a stampede and a lot of cows are heading your way and you need to get out of the way fast, or you're in a race and you should run. And I looked up around me and I realized I'm on this hill and all on this hill on both sides are fans cheering their brains out again up this painful, awful hill. These people are cheering and saying, go, go, you got it, you're almost at the top, you can do it. And I looked around, and I was the only person on that hill. <laughs> I was like, well, I can't stop now, because it'd be really awkward. <laughs> oh, I guess I better go. And I started to go up that hill again, and I didn't know until that very moment that it wasn't coffee or fun dip that powers me. It's the sound of a cowbell. <laughs> like, you hear that ringing, and suddenly you're like, I got this. I do have this. Oh, I, yeah, cool. And so I kept going, and I approached City Park, where the race was ending, and it was a beautiful sight, beautiful sunny morning. There are families enjoying a picnic. Um, there are people congratulating each other. There are bodies lying everywhere. Uh, and I crossed the finish line in 545.38. Yeah, right? Woo! Wasn't on the bucket list before, but I checked it off immediately. I was like, all right, done. 
And I learned a, a few lessons that day. Yeah, new shoes were dumb. <laughs> uh, I probably should have trained, but I learned I'm a lot tougher than I gave myself credit for. That I was a lot stronger than I even thought I was. And I knew that I was prepared at some level because um, of working in construction. 100% of the reason that I was able to finish a marathon without training was because I'm mentally tough and I work in construction, which has made me physically tough. And I love that. I wouldn't choose to do anything else. And I realized the second thing is that no matter how tough and strong I am, sometimes everybody needs a cheerleader. Sometimes everybody needs someone to say, what you're doing is great, and you're up to something awesome, and you're nailing it. And I, I didn't realize how valuable that was. And so that is also why I am so proud to be here today, because I am your cheerleader. Believe it or not, I have been traveling the world, and I talk about you folks all the time. I cheer you on without you even knowing it, and it's a pleasure to be here with you face to face and say, I am your biggest cheerleader. And so, to the teachers out there, to the teachers who take the time to work with and love with their students, to pass on that passion and soul of what it means to work in the trades, and impart into them the knowledge and tools that are going to make them successful, I cheer you on. You're up to something awesome. Believe me, out there right now are jobs waiting for your students. You are giving them the key to success by passing it on. So fabulous job. To the administ yes, please give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> to the administrators who are out there, who are fighting to find space and funding and teachers to pass this on, who are also fighting a public perception, maybe with your school board or parents, on what it means to be encouraging our students to consider the trades, I say you're doing a great job and you're nailing it. You are on to something awesome and continue that path because times are changing and people are starting to stand up and recognize that this is valuable. So please let's give a round of applause to the administrators. And lastly, I'd like to thank the companies and organizations who are somehow managing to find time out of their own businesses to consult and collaborate with curriculum, to sometimes provide equipment and funding to schools. I not only cheer you on, but I say thank you. This is a huge, huge thing, and it's bizarre that we've suddenly put the onus on businesses and organizations to help lead our next generation to success. But it's necessary now, and your input is critical. So please keep doing what you're doing because you're on to something awesome. And so I'm going to leave you with this. Thank you again. I hope you have all had a fantastic conference, and Woo! yeah!